y'all it's your girl Sakina and I'm back for another review this is my review for power book to ghost season one episode three like I said y'all that is a lot to be saying but anyway let's get into it oh yeah and by the way I did dye the wig y'all I think it looks a lot better dark I don't like brown on me but anyway yeah, back to the review. Well, the episode starts off with Drew and Kane making their rounds around town, collecting the monies. And then they stopped at one of the collectees' places of business or wherever they was. And he said that he didn't have their money. So he's begging and pleading to pay them next week. And Kane is like, nigga, are you serious? You know, so he get the whoop in his ass. But Drew was like, bro, stop. You know, as we can see, we get a glimpse of Drew. He is you know, the nice guy, the good guy. And he tells the guy, look, you have to the end of the week to get our money or next time I'm not stopping him from moving your ass. We see Diana down at the house and she's chilling. She's texting Tariq. Tariq is saying, thank you for helping me out with my mom's situation. I want to thank you and your mom in person. So he's trying to get his way over there, right? So then uh, Kane and Drew come into the house and they're talking. Diane or Diana shows them a live of some GTG gang members, I guess. I don't know if they're a gang or crew members, whoever, but you know, they wilding out on live, doing the most, come to find out they work for the Tejadas. So they're like, uh-uh, they doing way too much. And Diana was like, well, we gotta tell mine. Of course, Monet comes in and was like, tell me what? So she shows her the live and she was like, oh hell no, nah, these niggas are stupid as hell. So then she goes and gets on the phone with Lorenzo and told him about it. She really, she really ready to get the GTG members out of their business but uh lorenzo was like no um little guap i guess he's the leader or whatever the hell his dad took a bullet for lorenzo so he was like no basically he owed him he can't do that but monet is like if they get stopped by the police one of them young niggas gonna start to singing and then we gonna be in some trouble but he was like bro just listen to me have drew go over there and talk to them and she was like drew like no let's do kane Lorenzo said no. Drew needs to one needs to be the one to do it. So then Monet goes and tells the kids, and they all looking like Drew. Like what the fuck? Drew feel like he can't handle it. They ain't gonna take me serious. But Daddy's orders. You gotta do what you gotta do. So when him and Diana leave the room, Monet tells Kane like, "Look, I need you to watch out for your brother. I need you to follow him that night." don't be seen just make sure that you watch his back so we see how that unfolds later down at the jail davis is yelling at tasha telling her she need to tell the truth she still stands firm on silver being in love with her and that ghost find out found out about their love affair so then he kills silver but they just like look you lying you doing way too much Paula was like, how did you know where the body was going to be? And Tasha's like, because I know who I married. Like, I know I took a wild guess and I was right. Their issue is Sax was able to make the situation sound true in which the judge believed it. So if the judge believe it, the jury is going to believe it. So then David says the famous line that we see in all the trailers is not the truth that matters. It's what we can sell to a jury. And then Tasha gets this bright idea where she feels like she can talk on the stand and basically convince the jury that she's not the queen pen. And, um... Davis is like, not with your lying ass girl, by. I thought that was funny when he said that, like, bitch, they are over you and they know you be lying. She feels like she's stronger than any BS that Sax throws her way. And then she walks out. Paula is like, are you crazy? Do you, you know that she can't be on the stand? She ain't even been truthful with us. And Davis is like, I know that. I know she hard headed, but we just gonna let her think that. So then we see Tariq showing up to canonical studies and he's late yet again. And uh, Dr. Simmons or Mr. Simmons, whatever the hell his name is, was saying, sir, do you have a clock? Because uh, you're, you're late. What's going on? And then he said, didn't you hear that punctuality is a virtue? And then Tariq finishes the sentence and was like, of the board. So obviously that was a part of the book that they were reading, which is called The Apology. Um, Tariq did finish this book. So shout out to him for doing that. So then they go into this heated debate because... You know, um, what's his name? Simmons asked him, uh, what did you learn about the virtues of Socrates' actions in front of the court? So Tariq was like, nothing, because what he did was stupid. He didn't defend himself. Simmons gets offended, obviously, and then calls him remedial, saying that I knew that you couldn't handle this class. It was too advanced. It's just like, wait, hold the fuck up. I didn't like how he did that. And I'm glad that Tariq got his ass together. He was like, no, I finished the book. I understand what is going on. However, I just don't connect with that. He was like, um, there was no virtue in his actions. He made a mockery of the courtroom and forgot the action that was against him, which is why he died. Equaling, he's not virtuous. He also mentioned that 
men who think they're above the law, you know, it doesn't end well. And when he was saying that, I was like, mm, your daddy, you're describing your dad because he definitely did think that he was above the law. So Simmons in his feelings and he was like, so all these years of scholarships of Socrates are incorrect in your opinion. Listen, man, Tariq is like, um, scholars can be wrong. So yeah, I said what I said. And as he's saying all of this, you know, Jabari is in the background and he's like, hmm, okay. You know, he's impressed by um, Tariq's clapback. Now, when the class is over, Lauren was like, why are you going against him? Like, that's not going to help you get along. But I feel like he did the right thing. He did what the hell he needed to do. I don't give a fuck about none of that. So she was just like, well, you need to play this game. But I was like, didn't you? Wasn't you opinionated in the first episode? I'm not understanding. But whatever. She wants to play the game. And she was like, you know, you need to let people help you who want to help you. People like me. He brushed her off and was like, yeah, um, maybe you could do that one day, but I got to go. And then he goes and texts Brayden, like, let's make this money. So then we see Tasha at the cafeteria, whatever, down at the jail, and she's watching, what's her name? Layla, uh, the lady who needed a plan B. So she's just trying to find a way to, you know, go in there and give her the plan B. She swoops in, she drops the plan B off to her, and she was like, uh, where did you get it? That's what Layla asked her. She was like, um, I got it from a friend. Um, are you a friend, Layla? And she was like, uh, why do you need a friend in here, honey? This is just a bus stop, sweetie. Uh, there's no need to be making friends. Um, but Tasha seems to think that she knows her way around there. Layla thinks that Tasha knows how to make her way around there. Obviously, she got moves to get plan Bs and shit. But, you know, I guess they're going to try to work with each other. It really wasn't said. But while they're doing all of this talking... Uh, we notice that there is a man that's taking photos of Tasha. Come to find out this man's name is Bishop and he works for Lorenzo. So after the conversation ends, he goes to report to Lorenzo, I guess on the men's side of the jail. I don't fucking know. But anyway, he goes and tells Lorenzo um, that Tasha didn't need this plan B for herself. She gave, gave it to somebody else. And basically they're watching her. And as he's going into the story, that's when Lorenzo got the call from Monet about um, Lil Guap and them. We already know they plotting on something, right? Now we see that Zeke is being a bum. He's at the damn dorm room and telling Tariq he got a paper due, he thinks, in two days, which is the same day that Tariq got work due. So he's like, bro, I can't be doing your work in mine. Like, you need to be trying to do some of your work. And that's what I'm saying. I've been saying that, like, Zeke is so fucking bummy. And it's just like, ugh, baby, whatever. But then Tariq was like, you know, um, I need you a favor or whatever. I want to get permission from Monet to date Diana. Zeke is like, she can't go on no dates. But Tariq is like, look, I, I want to see what's good. But Zeke is like, we can't mix family in school no more. After what happened at that last dinner, Monet don't want you over there no more. So, you know, Tariq is like, oh, damn. But, you know, he's going to find a way to get back in there. Now we see Tasha getting tossed in the paddy wagon down at the jail. And she's like, where, where we going? I need my lawyer. But they was like, look, you about to meet them in a minute. So then come to find out she's doing a mock trial. So they had to get her all dressed up and stuff. I said, come on, y'all finally got my girl a good wig. Y'all finally got my girl a good wig. And it was only for a temporary wear. So I was like, ugh, that's fucked up. But anyway, she looked real cute. Davis did let her know this is a mock trial. So anything that you say in here is cool because everybody has signed an NDA. So mm, be truthful spill it all out so davis feels like you have to prove to me that you're worthy of being on the stand so you need to act as if you are standing in front of a real jury keep in mind that you are paying all of these people for the hour now uh tasha did say that she is positive that she can you know convince the jury that she's innocent girl no you can't like you swear that you can and no it's not a waste of time of them doing this because this is a practice run that your ass needs now, Tasha is still sticking to this Tommy story about how Tommy is the one who killed Ghost. And then she was saying, yes, she told him to do it, but she's not proud of her actions. Davis asked her, when did everything change between you and James? She said that they got pulled over one day and he had a gun in the car. She was pregnant with the kids. He said, put the gun in your maternity dress because they're not going to check you. So she was like, you know, I had to hide the gun next to my babies. And, you know, that's just when it all changed. Yes, her name is on some documents because, uh, or as far as accounts, she helped open accounts and stuff because James made her do all of this and she said that she never had a choice and of course she didn't knew, know of his criminality. Now as she's doing all of this she's looking at the jury with these puppy dog eyes and trying to sell this story and I'm just like girl you look so obvious like who are you convincing and then at the end she you know sat back and hmm did one of them like she was just so proud of herself like girl boo you gonna change that facial expression real quick. You see that Brayden is going to get a physical. He goes and steals a few prescription scripts 
or slips. I don't know why that's such a tongue twister for me. But Tariq is like, yes, I need you to go get some pills, bruh. You know, because he doesn't have a connect yet. And Brayden is like, okay, well, you need to come. Do you want to come with me? And Tariq is like, no, because I need to distract the competition while we're, you know, making these moves. We see later on that Epiphany is the one that is going to distract Scott which is the local campus drug dealer. So, you know, she handcuffs him and she's doing a little dance and then she gets a phone call and a text message from Tariq saying, you need to keep him there until I say so. So, you know, she handcuffed him and get on the phone with somebody that's supposed to be her boyfriend. But I like her. She real cute with her little yellow terrible ass wig. Now we see that Diane and Monet are going down to Zeke's game. Zeke did mention that he had a game, which is why he couldn't do the paper that Tariq now has to do. So it's the day of the game. They're going to support him. They're walking and talking. And Diana mentions that she wants to play basketball. But Monet is like, look, uh, the WNBA don't get no damn money. And that's not what's important to the family right now. She wants to go to school. But Monet is like, mm-mm, family business is first. You know, she was like, I mean, y'all don't need me. Dad wants the boys to take care of that. Monet asks Diane, does she think that Drew has what it takes to handle the GTG boys? No. Kane is the one that brings on the hammer, you know, and Drew looks like the good guy. Of course, he does not have what it takes, but um, Diane was asking, well, what if you're wrong about people? Monet said she don't have time to be wrong, and then she mentioned that she was wrong about Tariq. You know, Kane was supposed to scare him, but that wasn't the case. And she was like, look, um, I don't need you to be trying to bring up Tariq, okay? Uh, I got him looked up, and anybody that's around him for too long end up in jail or dead. Stay away from him. I said what I said, Okay. So then we see that uh, Zeke is in the locker room and he is talking to this basketball player named Connor who looked like he don't know. Okay, I can't say that. But anyway, yeah, Connor is taking Zeke's place since he's on academic probation. But Zeke is telling Connor, like, look, I'm about to be off of academic probation soon, so I'm going to need you to chill out. You know, Zeke was supposed to be back on the first game. I don't know if they mentioned what game this was, but um, he's not on the court. So the coach is like, look, you can't practice with us, but you can talk to the press after the game and, you know, just tell them that you're sorry that you wasn't able to play. And Zeke was like, well, it's not my fault. Excuse me, you're the one on academic probation, ain't you? What the hell you mean it's not your fault? Z Zeke is dumb as fuck. Like, he is like my least favorite character right now. I can't stand his old lazy ass. So, you know, Tariq sees uh, Monet in old girl walking into the building and he wants to walk with them and thank them for you know uh doing what they did for tasha monet being real cold like oh, yeah nigga i ain't trying to hear all of that but diane stops and talks to him and they go into a conversation about what was wrong with monet diane how are you a part of a drug dealing family and you telling all their business about the gtg boys and shit like that shit was so weird to me and then uh monet is off on the side talking to zeke's coach and that's when she finds out that he wasn't going to be able to play. And he's not off of academic probation. And she looking at Tariq like, nigga, you the one who's supposed to be doing this work. What the hell is going on? But uh, Diane ends up calling her dad while they were there, there. And I guess she was talking to him about the whole school situation, in which we learn later. But then we see that Drew goes down to the GTG headquarters or wherever the hell to talk to Lil Guap and tell him that, you know, I'm here because Monet is proud of all the work that you've been putting in. So he's like, okay, that's you know she she giving me praise that's that's what's up you know we've been doing a lot of social media stuff you know young niggas out here want to want to live like the like us they want to see what we living like so drew is like okay well about that i'm gonna need you to cut that out i need you to lay low because um that's bringing a lot of attention you got to chill on that so then little guap was like okay well we're gonna chill he pulls up his phone he get on live again and then he tries to turn the camera over to drew and drew knocked the phone out his hand so of course you know they get up they having a little conversation little guap tries to take a dig at monet saying you know she on my dick because she ain't got no dick in a long time so you know them fighting words bitch we ready to go but drew has his hand in his bag like on his gun but it's like nigga you should have pulled that out a long time ago drew does not have the assertiveness that kane has and that's when kane did come in and shut all of that shit down and he was like look you know little guap changed his tone real quick once he seen who came through the building so you know kane was like let's go drew Drew left. Kane acting all ratchet and unpredictable, get to shooting up the place. So, you know, scaring niggas. When they get out, Drew is mad because he's like, why did you come here? Like, I had the shit handled. And then they run into the cops. So, of course, they start running. One of the uh, cops was left in the cruiser, and it was Ramirez. He was like, shit, I recognize those boys. So, they run, and they end up hiding. And then 
there was nowhere for them to go. So the police was getting on them. Like, he was about to find them eventually. And Kane was like, shit, uh, we about to have to handle this. So he was going to kill the cop. And Drew was like, we can't do that. He was like, not we, nigga, me. So Ramirez came and saved the day and told the cop, like, bro, they went this way. You know, telling them they went the opposite way. So that caused the police to turn around and leave. He's like, damn, y'all niggas was really about to get caught. All because Kane asked one to be irrational. So then we see that Zeke is talking to the reporters after the game and they was asking, you know, do you have any kind words for Connor since he's been, you know, taking your spot and won't keep your seat warm? And Zeke was like, nope, I don't have nothing to say to him because I will be playing next week. And the coaches look like this motherfucker because, of course, he's not supposed to play next week. So um maybe he's going to be in there now we see that ramirez goes and takes the information over to monet about her sons having to run from the police and he was like if they would have got called there was no way that i could drop the charges she's grateful for it but he wants her to lay low you know get out of sight at least until the pt cruiser start going to stop circling around the gtg headquarters but she can't do that you know business has to operate it has to keep going but um she tries to distract him with some cat and which is very awkward to see Miss uh, Mary J. Blige in this light. I can't see her being a sexual woman. It's like, oh, baby, I don't. I know she don't want us to call her auntie, but you know, I don't want to see her do that. Now, um, in the midst of this, she gets a text from Lorenzo, and he was like, "You need to come up here." Now we see that Brayden did make a killing at the party. You know, he sold all the drugs, all the pills, but it didn't amount to enough for Tariq because he is selling these drugs to pay off Tasha's lawyer fees. But Brayden is like, you know what? I'm all in. I'm here with you, bro. You know, we're going to make this money. Don't worry. Now, speaking of Tasha, we see that she is on uh, trial number two, and this is for a cross-examination. Now, of course, we can't practice with sex, but we can get the closest thing to him, which is Tamika. So they start off the whole conversation with Tamika asking Tasha about the accounts. You opened up accounts. Yes, you did. Okay. Um, you opened up these accounts and what did you do with them? I cleaned it with the club, laundry mat, parking lots. Yep. But then Tamika was like, oh yeah, and you did live off of this said drug money, right? So, you know, Tasha was just like, mm-hmm okay yeah she did and then Tamika's like okay well you say that you were scared of James but you also had an affair with Silva and then um Tasha was saying that she was in love with him and then James killed him and Tamika's like hold on wait I know you're not about to sit here and tell the jury that James killed Silva because he was jealous at that time he was with Angela baby so let's not do that he was not even stung you but then she said you told James about Silva in the feds you also admitted to Blanca that you had sex with Silva to stall out time for James to arrive. And uh, unfortunately, Silva never made it out that garage, honey. And you knew exactly where that body was when the feds came to your house asking where he was. So she was like, the only thing that you left out was the fact that you gave the order to make all this shit happen. Tamika was like, look, you knew that Silva was bad for business, so he had to be taken out. And then when it came down to ghosts, Tasha was like, Ghost didn't take any orders. He didn't, but Tommy did. I said, boom, bitch. The more you talk and blame Tommy, the more this is coming back on you. Like, Tasha is so irritating, y'all. I was just like, oh, my God. Stop her from talking, please. So then she really got on her ass for real when she brought up Angela. It was like, okay, so did you make Tommy kill Angela too? Because um, James was still fucking with her. He was the love of your life, right? He was still fucking with her even after y'all daughter got killed. Like, um, what was going on with that? Did you tell Tommy to kill him uh, as a cry for help? I was like, ooh, baby. And then she said that James ended up being killed. Okay, so did you kill him because he was leaving the business for Albany and he got a new bitch? Like, what's T, sis? And it's just like, ah! Tasha, you swore up and down that you had this in the bag and that you was going to be able to convince the jury that you are not the queen pen. But no, you sitting there naming Tommy is bringing this all back to you because you do know shit. And it's just like, girl, you think you're a mastermind, but you're not. Come to find out all 12 people on the jury found her guilty. You know, she's in disarray. She's taking off her makeup. She's crying. Paula ain't trying to hear none of that shit. She like, look, girl, if you don't tell the truth, you're going to be wearing this orange suit for the rest of your life, okay? And then uh, Tamika was talking to Davis. 
And she was saying that, look, Sax knows way more than me. So if I was you, I would be coming down to him on bended knee asking for another plea deal. Davis is like, look, I need you to join the team. Um, I need you, okay? I can't win this case without you. Let's do it. Black dream team taking motherfuckers down. And she was like, up. Oh, no, I will not be doing that. And that's when Davis was like, okay, well, um, what about you representing Sax? Honey, I know all about that. He signed a waiver for you to uh, represent Tasha. I know that he was in need and he came to you. So uh, don't think you slick. And Tamika was like, mm, bye. But you know, she was worried. And that's what Davis was saying. Because Paula was like, can we just drop this case yet? Nope, Davis is still in this. And he was like, uh-uh, we just gonna double down because the look on her face, baby, something is up. This is not about Tasha, this is about sex. And we gonna get down to the bottom of it. Now we see Mary J. Blige in the bed again, but this time she in the bed with her husband. And he's basically telling her like, look, I don't like the way that you running this business. It's sloppy. And she was like, well, you need to let me do my thing. But he mad because she going against him. He was like, look, you deliberately disobeyed me. I cannot. And you need to stop baby and Drew. You need to let him do his thing. He has to be the one to do all of this because you're too attached to Diane and uh, Kane is too unpredictable. He has to be the one to do it. But she was just like, um, uh-uh. And then he mentioned that Diane needs to go to school. And she was like, oh, so this is what it's all about? He was like, look, it never was supposed to go down this way. You know, you can't run this shit forever. Let the girl go to school. And he was like, you know, just trust me, baby. I feel like they need to go ahead and let her go to school. Monet is doing too much. She clearly don't want to be a part of the family business. Don't make me be a part of the drug dealing business. Like, bitch, I want to go to school and play basketball the fuck. So then we see that uh, Tariq is getting his grades back from his paper. Um, he ends up getting an NC, which is a no credit because he did end up going with Oliver's views, who Oliver is uh, Mr. Simmons. So he ended up going with his views. And, you know, Lauren was like, see, I told you to do the right thing or whatever the fuck she said. She ended up getting the A, but he got a no credit. Now, Tariq addresses Mr. Simmons about it. He was like, baby, look, <laughs> I'm too professional to be trying to grade papers. You need to take that up with Mr. Reynolds, a.k.a. Jabari. So Tariq goes and runs up on Mr. Reynolds and was like, um, why did you grade me like this? Now, before he ran into his office, actually, Jabari was on the phone trying to call Carida. She ain't been answering. He left her a message like, look, I don't know where you been at, but you need to pick up the phone. And then that's when Tariq had came in and was like, bro, why you give me an NC? Now, the problem is Jabari is upset that Tariq conformed to Simmons' ideas. So he was like, the grade is not being changed. You should have stu stood firm in your word. Because um, you have to deal with the consequences of not being authentic. So, sorry, sir. I'm not changing it. I said what I said. Now, Monet is down at the house yelling at her kids about the GTG situation. You know, uh, Kane is telling on Drew because he was not being authoritative. And he didn't pull out his gun or nothing like that. And Monet is like, uh, do you work for them or do they work for us? Like, I don't know what the hell y'all got going on. Get the hell out of my face. The only way y'all was being able to be saved is because of Ramirez. And I'm not about to keep sucking his dick to save y'all. That's what I was getting from that. <laughs> but then she goes and asks Diane, um, I'm going to ask you this one time. Did you call your dad about school? Diane said no. So then Monet was like, well, go get the family burner phone. She checked the call log and was like, okay, well, I guess she was telling the truth. Mm, we know she was lying. And so did Monet. I told y'all Monet was going to find out, right? So she did run up on Diane, checked her purse, and then checked her little overalls and found her burner phone. She was like, girl, you going against me? I already told you my house, my rules. Don't be trying to go behind my back having your own burner phone. And to me, I feel like, because she did take the phone and um, smash it on the ground, I feel like Monet is definitely having like a, some type of power trip or something. Like she's cracking under pressure. She's stressed because, you know, she wants things to go one way and then Lorenzo wants it to go another way. So, you know, they're not on common ground. So I feel like, you know, she, she stressed the hell out. And Lorenzo was fine as hell, side note. I was like, ooh, hey. Now, Tariq is upset with Zeke because he like, look, nigga, you sitting here talking about you busy. Your ass in here playing a damn game. You ain't doing none, none of your damn work. Like, what the fuck is up? I need you to be doing your work. So, Zeke was like, oh, I'm sorry. He was like, no, bro, we, we on the same team here. I need you to be doing some of your work. I can't help you if you can't help yourself. So, he was like, no more apologies. I need you to do me this one favor, and it's about Aunt Monet. So, he like, damn, nigga, you bring up my album. One more fucking time. Now we get this quick irritating ass scene with Jabari sitting in his office with some young student acting like a damn hoe. And she talking about how she first read his book, Raw, which is the book about Caridad and their relationship. 
So, you know, she was like, oh my gosh, I wonder how it would be to be in her shoes or some shit. They end up fucking, I was fuckless. And we just gonna move on to the next scene. Oh, Carrie Dad did hear moaning and groaning because she ended up going to the office. Okay, whatever. Now we see that Monet did go and pick up Zeke and she went into the dorm. Tariq was supposed to be gone, but of course it was a setup for them to talk. And Zeke was like, I'm sorry I went against you, but he want to talk to you for five minutes. So Tariq is like, um, yes, let's get this money. I need somebody to help me. I need a supplier. Um, look at all this money that I made in a few hours. How much money is you able to make in these, in this time frame? She was like, hold on, wait, nigga, you might want to uh, check yourself here. But, um, what's her name? She was saying that she doesn't trust Tariq. And he was like, but you trust me with Zeke, baby, that's it for schoolwork. That's it. My business is out in Queens and that's where it needs to stay. She don't want Zeke in that. And he was like, okay, well, I see that Zeke is your priority. Well, what if I flunk out because my family is my priority and I'm, you know, doing what I can without me, there's no Zeke, honey. So get that straight. So she was like, okay, well, if I agree to work with you, Zeke can't have no dealings with this. He can't have no knowledge of all of this. So, um, y'all need to not live together. So he was like, okay, that's cool. I got somewhere else I can stay, AKA Brayden's house. And then to, Tasha ends up calling him. So that kind of interrupted their conversation. She was just basically saying that she's stressed out because, she out here lying to Davis. And she was like, you need to do whatever you can to pay him. And he was like, all right, I've got it handled. Don't worry. Now we see that Monet is on the phone with Lorenzo. She was like, you know, we don't trust Tariq. You know, he want to work with us, but we ain't here for that. So then Lorenzo was like, okay, well, what's his weakness? And she was like, he is the weakness. I said, damn, okay. Do y'all not know he's a St. Patrick? He ain't that weak, nigga. His daddy is ghost. The ghost. St. Patrick. James. And it's, it is very weird that they are from the same hood. Y'all don't know Tommy. Y'all don't know Kanan. Y'all don't know shit, Breeze. Y'all don't know nobody. Like, I'm just so confused. Like, y'all don't know about the Queens Project? That's just really odd to me. But whatever, you know. Lorenzo ends up calling Tasha on the burner phone and was like, look, um, we got your son Tariq working for us. And if he don't follow his our orders, he's going to be dead. So I'm going to need you to make sure that he follows suit. And Tasha is looking like, fuck, you know, looking like she was actually about to get into some gangster shit. I was like, okay. But that's where the episode had ended. So y'all let me know how y'all feel about this episode. Now, this episode was good. I definitely feel like it's really about to start rolling now because the previews were showing like a whole bunch of, you know, shit about to go down. Um, I feel like as far as Mary J. Blige's acting, she always acts on these episodes as if she's tired or like she's just here to do a job and she ready to go to fuck home after this you know she's not really one for the intimate scenes i can definitely definitely tell i don't think we're going to get a sex scene from her i, I hope not either but yeah y'all let me know what y'all think about her acting but anyway thank y'all for watching please don't forget to like comment subscribe to my channel and i will see y'all in the next one bye